bless your name tonight because you are the Lord. We give you all the glory and honor. We worship you. We adore you. We lift your name on high. We say, Lord, thank you. We bless you. We give you praise. You alone are worthy. You are holy. You are faithful. You are righteous and good. There is no one like you. We say, Lord, hallowed be your name. For you alone are the Lord. We thank you for bringing us together back in class so we can study at your feet, so we can be well equipped for the assignment that you have for us, oh God. So Holy Spirit, tonight we want to see you. We pray that you showcase your power in our midst. We pray that you feed us with manna from heaven above. We pray that you empower your word, that it will not return to you void. We pray that you open our eyes of understanding. So at the end of it all, you take all the glory. Holy Spirit, we invite you to be our instructor tonight. Father, come and teach us your word. Take all the glory, Lord. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. In Jesus' name, we have prayed. Amen. Amen. God bless everyone. It is good to have you back in class. May the Lord bless and keep you in the name of Jesus Christ. So, uh, to the glory of God this semester, I will be teaching this class, one of my favorite class ever, homiletics, homiletics. And the book, the textbook we are using is titled The Preacher and His Preaching by A.P. Gibbs, The Preacher and His Preaching. I first came across this particular book in 1994. 1994, I studied then the same book I used uh, for my homiletics class when I was in Bible school. Praise God. So I believe, uh, as we are instructed, I believe many of us, we have read through all the way to chapter three. I actually wanted us to read up to chapter four, but being that I've already sent out that we should read up to chapter three, so I didn't bother to uh reach out back to us to read one more chapter so let me take it one by one uh sister stevenson sister alicia is good to have you back in class uh yeah yeah it's good to have you back sister sherry is good to have you back in class sister desring is good to have you back in class sister doreen it's good to have you back. Sister Grace, it's really good to have you back in class. Praise God. Sister Joy, it's good to have you back. Uh, Brother Morris, it's good to have you back. Sister Jackson, it's good to have you back. Sister Teniola, it's good to have you back. And Sister Ramona, it's, good, it's really good to have you back in class. Praise God, I hope. Others will be joining us as the class is, uh, as class continues. Praise the Lord. It is well with us. So the preacher and his preaching, being that you've read up to chapter three, I will believe that you have read the introduction. So we won't have to go through that. I believe you have read uh, the introduction. So let's jump right into chapter one. And when we look at chapter one, because right here, people of God, we are talking about the preacher. And I believe many of us, that's main reason why you are here, because the Lord is giving you an assignment. You are not here by accident. God is preparing you for that great assignment that he has prepared for you, or the great assignment that a heart for you, the reason why you were born. Many of us don't know that that's the reason why you were born. So you can proclaim the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. So if you have not paid attention to any class, I believe and I will encourage you to pay attention to this particular class because every other class prepares you, but this particular class is a tool that you need to take out there or the tool that you need to step up on the pulpit. So chapter one, the qualifications of the preacher. The qualifications 
of the preacher. You see, the person who proclaims the gospel is called a preacher. And the person who proclaims the gospel is called a preacher. What about the presentation of the gospel message? What do we call that? We call it preaching the gospel. Preaching the gospel. But there's one thing, there's one thing. It doesn't matter how many times I've read this book, it always stands out to me. We cannot divorce the preacher from his preaching. We cannot divorce the preacher from his preaching. The preacher is his message. The speaker is a sermon. If you want to know if a, a, the sermon or the preaching that the preacher is preaching is genuine, look at his life. Because his life we preach the gospel. If his life, if his lifestyle is different or a, if his life contradicts to the message that is preaching or the message contradict to the lifestyle, then we know something is wrong. Something is definitely wrong because it's the man, it is the man behind the message that determines his weight. When you see someone that, someone that's, that lives a loose life, that's now trying to preach holiness, then you will call yourself or you call you 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 you, you will pay attention to such a person's life you will call yourself and say okay something is going on something is not hard enough <laughs> something is not hard enough because this man or this woman is living a loose life now is trying to preach holiness and righteousness something is now hard enough praise god so that's why the speaker is his sermon, and the preacher is his message. You cannot separate it. Praise God. So when we are talking about the qualification of a preacher, the first thing first, he must be regenerated. That means a preacher must be born again. A preacher must be born again. If a preacher is not born again, then we have problem. Then what is he preaching? That reminds me, it reminds me of a situation that happened, I believe, like six, seven, or eight years ago. I believe I've shared this before, but not and this uh from, not from this lens. So I was invited to come and minister in Japan. I flew all the way here 18 hours to Japan. When I landed in Japan, the day that I supposed to minister, the time I supposed to minister is 15 minutes before the time. That's when I was informed that A, this mass choir that we invited you to come and speak to, mass choir, there are 1,000, 1,000 members of this mass choir. But none of them believed in Jesus. When I heard that, I said, whoa, whoa, whoa. Then what are they singing about? <laughs> Who are they praising? Who are they worshiping? If they a mass choir singing to the Lord, worshiping the Lord that they don't know. Right there, because everything that I prepared, all the message and everything that I prepared just went out of the window. Now we are talking about the preacher, right? Just went out of the window. And right there, they told me, you only have 30 minutes. I said, no, I have 15 minutes. And the, and the lady said, no, you have 30 minutes. I said, no. I have 15 minutes because I do not speak Japanese. So somebody had to <laughs> translate. <laughs> somebody had to interpret for me. And so that means I only have 15 minutes. Don't forget that you have 15 minutes and you are preaching to the choir, 
that don't know Jesus. And right there at that moment, something clicked because at that point, everything that I prepared, that I thought I would be preaching for two hours, was out of the window. I don't even know where to start and what to do. And at this point, I only have like seven, eight minutes left to step on the pulpit. At that point, I just surrendered to the Holy Spirit. I said, Lord, what do I do? And something just came, a light bulb just went on on my head. When Apostle Paul found himself in, in, that, in, in that city of, I believe it was the city of Philippi, as he was going and he found that temple where they serve the unknown God, the unknown God. And Apostle Paul was telling them after worshiping with them, he said, the God that you don't know, I do know him. I will introduce you to him. <laughs> Praise God. So what brought this story or this experience up is a preacher must be born again. Not like mass choir that are singing to the Lord, but they are not born again. They don't even know who Jesus is. Praise God. So for you to step up there, to tell the world that Jesus is Lord, you must know Jesus as your Lord. You must be able to personalize it. You must be able to publicly declare and confess that Jesus died on the cross for you, not just for your audience. Praise God. Now, when we look at it today, let's look at the possibility of self-deception. Let me say that again. The possibility of self-deception. There are hundreds, if not thousands of preachers today who have never experienced the regenerating power of the Spirit of God. They don't know who the Lord is. I've heard the story of a preacher, this pastor, not just ordinary pastor, he is the CEO and the founder of this large ministry. Praise God. And he's been ministering for over 20 years. One day, and an evangelist was invited. He invited an evangelist to come and hold a revival in their church. During that revival, that's when he now gave his life to Christ. And he's been preaching for over 20 years. But that's when he finally gave his life to Christ. You don't want your case as a preacher to be like that. I can remember when I was in this class, one of my colleagues, a pastor, a lady, that we were in class together, but at the same time, we were colleague in ministry. I didn't know all this. She has just not given her life to Christ. That was the time she gave her life to Christ during this particular class. Because a preacher must be regenerated. A preacher must be born again. Must be born again. You see, there are so many preachers today that salvation has no meaning to them. Because the reason why in, they are in ministry is not about salvation and it has nothing to do with the heaven. Praise God. Ministry is just a mere profession. They went to school, they got their degree, and they look for a job. If you want to prove what I'm, talk, what I'm telling you right now, if you can pick up your phone and go on, go on indeed.com, you know what that means, right? Where you look for a job and put in a minister or a pastor's uh, position, you will see the list, long list, that they put there and they put all uh, the job requirements that are expected. But among all these job requirements, guess what? Salvation is not one of them. And don't forget this preacher, before they leave school, they will take a class called uh, public speaking. 
They are very good and they are very eloquent. So if not that you have the spirit of God in you, you will never know that they don't have salvation. But this class we will, we will be teaching at the same time, act as a preacher at the same time, simultaneously. Because right now, before we continue, I want to challenge you. Before you can step up to the pulpit to preach, have you given your life to Christ? Are you born again? Because on the inside of you, you know that you know that you know that you're not born again. Then there's a chance for you now. Praise God. Let's look at the description of such mere professors. In the book of Matthew chapter 15, verse 14, Jesus likened the Jewish leader of his days to blind leaders of the blind. When the blind is leading the blind, where do you think they are going? Let's look at the book of Matthew. <laughs> chapter 15, verse 14. The Bible says, let them alone. Okay, let me read another translation. It says, leave them alone. They are blind leaders. When one blind person leads another, both will fall into the same pit. Ah. There's one movie that I saw years ago and saw it uh, not too long ago again. It's tied to, uh, I know many of us, we've seen it. See no evil, hear no evil. And you see the blind guy, he was trying to cross the street. And there's another blind woman. And the blind woman tells the blind guy, say, can you help me cross the street? Instead of him telling her that I'm blind, he said, okay. <laughs> if you've seen that movie, you know what I'm talking about. And both of them and the blind began to lay the blind. And there was a delivery truck <laughs> that parked right there. <laughs> and they walking straight into the back of the delivery truck. And the delivery truck closed the door and carried them away. <laughs> Praise God. And that's what it is when you see a preacher that has not been born again, now trying to lead others. Praise God. So now let's look at the necessities for the preacher's own assurance of salvation. The necessity for the preacher's own assurance of salvation. Everyone who seeks to present the word of God to others should be certain he has experienced the new birth for himself. Some will argue there's nothing called assurance of salvation. Oh, no, you're wrong. Unless you don't have the Holy Spirit in you. If you have the Holy Spirit in you, you must be sure that you are saved. You must be sure that, yes, you have been born again. If you are not sure, then we need to walk you through uh, the, the, the sinner's uh, prayer and confession all over again. Praise the Lord. Let's look another qualification of the preacher. The preacher must uh, I went too far. It must be regenerated. Yes, the, the preacher must love the Lord Jesus. He must love the Lord Jesus. The love of Christ must be the constraining motives of all his services. You see, many people today, oh, believe me, I've worked with some of them. Oh, they work hard in ministry. They preach hard. Whenever they get on the pulpit, before they come down, it's not that they are just sweating. No, they are soaked. And when they step down, even when it comes to their duty to their members, they work hard. But guess what? To preach from a sense of duty is not enough. It's not enough. 
Because if you're only doing it from the sense of duty, it will get to a point where you'll be born out. You will be born out. But when you do it, only as the law, as the love of Christ is the impelling motive, shall one preaching be worth anything, anything. Because whatever you preach is worth nothing if it's not from the love of Christ. And the only way you can do this and not be burnt out is because you are doing it from the depth of the love of Christ that is in you. It doesn't matter what happened. You will continue to do it. It doesn't matter what happened. You don't feel tired. Uh, one of my spiritual sons was telling me not too long ago. I believe somebody is online with us today will remember what I'm about to say now. He said, I don't know what is going on with daddy. It looks like he always likes to create problems for himself. <laughs> Wait, why are we starting this new program again? And it's not because of anything. It's because of that love. It's because of that love. A preacher, you must love the Lord Jesus and everything you do must be from that love or as a result of that love. Hmm. I know of a preacher in this nation, in the United States, years ago that sent it on national TV that said no one can prove to him that Jesus is the only way to heaven. That day, I developed a headache that I suffered for over a week. I felt as if I should break that TV. Why was I so pissed off? Because we are not the only one watching it. Unbelievers watching it as well. Praise God. Okay, let's continue. Let's look at the example of Christ. Look at Christ's love for his father. It's the love that he has for his father brought him down to us. Involuntary, let me say involuntary subjection to God's will and his word. The constraining love led him all the way to Gethsemane. It guided him to Gabbatha, where he gave his back to the smiters. Mm -hmm. It moved him to Golgotha, where he allowed God to lay our sins on him is because of the love that he has for the Father and the love that he has towards us. Praise God. So, people of God, and we see that love at work when he was talking to his disciples especially when he was talking to Peter after the resurrection. Remember after the resurrection, when Peter told mm -hmm. all the other disciples, say, I'm going fishing. And they all left because master is gone. Mm -hmm. And they started fishing. Mm -hmm. And right there, Jesus appeared to them. He said, son, do you have any food? Ah, later on, when they realized that it was Jesus, Peter wanted to kill himself. He jumped in the water. <laughs> oh, Jesus, may the Lord help us. To call the long story short, at the end of it, Jesus asked him, he said, Peter, son of Jonah, do you love me? Do you love me? He said, yes, you know I love you. He said, then feed my sheep. You see what we are talking about? As a preacher, your preaching must be from the love of Christ towards the souls that you are ministering to. The love for Christ is so essential to the preaching of the gospel. It's so essential to the preaching of the gospel. I believe it was D.L. Modi that they interview one, they say, what is it? What drives you every day to go out 
to, to evangelize, to go out to preach and witness to the lost souls. He said, when I wake up in the morning, he said, the love of Christ take me over. And when I go out, everyone passing by, all are sitting in front on their forehead is four letter written, lost, 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 lost. He said, all I can do is just to do as much as I could to minister to them. Because it was the love for Christ that is driving his decision as he goes out to evangelize. Praise the Lord. Now, the next qualification is that he must love souls. He must love souls. Souls that you're preaching to. You must fall in love with them. You know, it is possible to love to preach without loving those to whom you are preaching. You can love to preach and you shout, you jump, you hope, you, you scream because you love to do that without loving those that you are preaching to. But one thing I want to tell us though, a preacher can never be a real worker for Christ without a deep passion for the lost souls to whom he preaches the gospel of God's grace. You must fall in love with the souls that you are preaching to. You must be willing to go extra mile, not out of duty, but out of love. But unfortunately today, the love of publicity, of basking in the limelight, of hearing the praises of men, and of cutting popularity has ruined many a preacher. I was talking to one of my spiritual sons um, early this morning. He called all the way from Lagos. Daddy, your son. And as we were talking, we get to a point that say, you know, you've been waiting for this for so long. God did something in his life. Say, you know, we've been waiting for this for so long. Then he get to a point as we were talking, something just dropped in my spirit. I said, listen, remember I've told you this before. This is your season of revelation. And the Lord is giving you a key to the old world. I said, but let me tell you something, man of God, where you are right now, I've been there, done that. And now say, I now use example of one of my nephews when he was in Dubai and the Lord began to promote him. What I told him then, and I told this man of God, I said, what God is doing now, don't let it get into your head. He said, please do not let it get into your head. Because once you allow that, you've missed it. And it has a very thin line. Very thin, very thin line. When you see what God is doing through you, then the devil will begin to whisper. Ah, may that not be your story in the name of Jesus Christ. So, people of God do not fall into that situation. Whenever anyone, because believe me, when God bless you with some talent and gift, I mean spiritual gifts, people will like to put you where you don't belong. When they come out to testify, they will begin to give glory to you instead of giving it to the Lord. You better throw that glory back on the altar and say, Lord, it belongs to you. Praise God. Now, if you are with me in the te now textbook, Come with me to page 36. I would like to read that worker's dream story. A worker's dream story. Hmm. It says, the author says, the following story called from a current magazine. We serve to illustrate the menace of this subtle temptation to which all preachers are susceptible. It is entitled A Worker's Dream. 
Now listen. He said, I sat down in an armchair, wearied with my work. My toil had been severe and protracted. Many were seeking Christ and many had found him. As for myself, I was joyous in my work. My brethren were united. My sermons and exhortations were evidently telling all my hearers my church was crowded. Mm. Okay, people of God, what else was a man of God, a woman of God wanted in life? He said, tired with my work, I soon lost myself in a sort of unforgetful state. Suddenly, a stranger entered the room without any pre preliminary tap or coming. He carried about his person measures, chemical agents and, and implements, which gave him a very strange appearance. He said, the stranger came toward me and extended his hand, said, how is your zeal? I suppose that the query was to be for my earth, but was pleased to hear his final words. I was quite well pleased with my zeal and doubted not that the stranger would smile when he should know his proportions. Say instantly, I conceived of it as physical quantity and putting my hand into my bosom, brought it forth and presented to him for inspection. He took it and placed it in the scale, weighed it carefully. I heard him say 100 pounds. I could scarcely suppress an audible note of satisfaction, but I caught his honest look as he noted down the weight. And I saw at once that he had drawn no final conclusion, but was intent on pushing his investigation. He broke the mass to atoms, put it into his crucible, and put the crucible into the fire. When the mass was fused, he took it out and set it to cool. He congealed it in cooling. And when, and when turned out on earth, exhibited a series of layers or strata, which all at the touch of the armor fell apart and was severely tested and weighed. The stranger, make, the stranger making minute notes as the process went on. When he had finished, he presented the notes to me and gave a look of mingled sorrow and compassion. As he left the room without a word, except may God save you. The notes read as, the notes read as follows. The analysis of the zeal of juniors, a candidate for a kind of glory. Weight in mass, 100 pounds. Say on this, on analysis, they are proved to be bigotry, 10 parts. Personal ambition, 23 parts. Love of praise, 19 parts. Pride of denomination, 15 parts. Pride of talent, 14 parts. Love of authority, 12 parts. Love to God, four parts. Love to man, three parts. And love to God and love to man are the real pure zeal. Out of 100, you only have seven. And he continues to say, I had become troubled at the peculiar manner of the stranger and especially at his parting look and words. But when I look at the figures, my heart sank as laid within me. I made a mental effort to dispute the correctness of the record, but I was startled into a more honest mode by an audible sigh from the stranger who had paused in the hall. I cried out, Lord, save me. And knelt down at my chair with the paper in my hands and my eyes fixed upon it. At once it became a mirror and I saw my heart reflected in it, the record was true. I saw it, I felt it, I confessed it, I deplored it, 
And I besought God to save me from myself with many tears. Then with a loud cry of anguish, I awoke. So people of God, as a preacher, I pray that you will not be like this worker. That at the end, when your work will be weighed on the scale, everything that matters will not be the least that you, are, you can provide or you can produce. Because what matters is the love for God and the love for man. Isn't that what Jesus said when he summarized Ten Commandments into two? So love the Lord your God with all your heart, your mind, your soul, your spirit, and soul. And at the same time, love your fellow man as you love yourself. <sighs> so people of God, we need to consider Christ's passions for soul. The earthly life of our Lord Jesus Christ as God's servant is the preacher's example of what it means to love souls, of what it means to love souls. Compassion has been defined as feeling the pain in another person's heart. The preacher who, love, who really loves souls will give himself ostentatiously and wholeheartedly to the task of winning them for Christ. Mm. What about the need for a right estimate of the soul's value? The right estimate of the soul's value. What's the value of a soul? Like I always tell people, someone that uh, time doesn't mean anything to, I say because you have not put a value on your time. If you have put a value on your time, you will not do that. Praise God. When you put a value on the soul, then you will do everything to go out and lead soul to the kingdom. Praise God. We must ever see men as souls having bodies rather than bodies Having souls. That is. We must ever see men as souls having bodies rather than bodies having souls. Because when you see souls having bodies, that's when we put our attention on the body. But when you see bodies, I mean, when we, when we look at bodies having soul, we pay our attention to the body. But when you see souls having a container, let me give you an example. When you order uh, a TV or you order an electronics or something special that you want to use in the house, when, is, when that particular item is delivered, is your attention on the box or that very thing that you paid for that is inside the box. Instead of us paying attention to the bodies that we see every day, why don't you pay attention to the souls? Because body is just the container. Soul is the real thing that Jesus paid for. There's nothing great in this world but man. And there's nothing great about man but his soul. We must estimate the value of the soul by the price Christ paid to secure his redemption. And what is the price? His most precious blood. His most precious blood. Mm. So people of God, we are talking about the qualification of the preacher. So far, if you can just come with me, the first qualification is he must be born again. He must be born again. The second qualification is he must love the Lord. He must love 
the Lord. And the third qualification is he must love souls. He must love so that Jesus died for. Then number four, he must be a student of the Bible. A preacher must be a student of the Bible. Just to say a preacher must be a man of the book, period. Because not only the Bible, you need to study material to make sure to remain relevant in the work that God has called you to do. He must know the word of God by reading it. He must know it by reading it. Hmm. I know one great man of God told me a long time ago, he said, to remain relevant in ministry, a man or woman of God must remain student of the Bible for the rest of his own life. As long as you live, you must remain a student of the Bible. So it is essential that a preacher should be well acquainted with the book from which he preaches. Let me, call, let, let me give us an example. Will you see a lawyer that's going out to defend somebody or going out to prosecute that will not study the law? It will he say, because I have studied the law in the law school, I don't have to do anything. If I go up there, I'm, 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 I will be able to, I'm, I must be able to defend that person. No, no, no. They will go back. And take all those Lord book and read over and over and over and prepare the way to handle the case so they can be effective in the courtroom. Now, how can I, a preacher, step on the pulpit without preparing, without going through my own law book to defend? the case when I step on that pulpit or to present my case in the presence of the people of God and the court of God himself. Will you see a doctor that say, I've known it all and they, they get a case that is trying to be hard and they will not go back to their book and look for it with not only their book and wherever such a case has happened before, and go and review it, what happened? How did they do it? How did they handle the case? Then who tells you or what makes you to believe that as a preacher, you don't need to study anymore because you know it all? Praise God. So it is essential that a preacher should be well acquainted with the book from which he preaches. He who is called to preach the Bible is also called to study the Bible for there cannot be one without the other. He who is called to preach the Bible is also called to study the Bible. He must both make and take time for the devotional reading of the Bible for his own soul's profit, because there are so many today. Because a preacher can be so occupied in feeding all that, that he becomes undernourished himself. You are dishing out, but you are not eating. It's like a mother that is, give, that is breastfeeding a baby, but she's not eating. That woman will soon collapse because everything that you have left in you, you are giving out and you are not eating. Praise God. So that's why it's very, very important for a preacher to remain a student of the Bible. You must remain 
a student of the Bible and you must know it by reading it. Today, there are some gene preacher. What do I mean by gene preacher? Gene, G-I-N. What does that acronym stand for? G-I-N means Google it now. All they do is they Google and they will look for the message of somebody else, they copy it and they will take it to the pulpit. <laughs> and the message that they copy, you don't know the inspiration that whoever prepared that message had when they prepared the message, if that inspiration is from the Lord or not. So you must know it. You must know the Bible by reading the Bible. He must be able to quote it from memory. He must be able to quote the Bible from memory. Praise God. To the glory of God, uh, one of my spiritual fathers is so blessed, but at the same time, he has this situation, I, I'll call it a situation, yeah. that as he was getting younger, then his eyes, his vision began to fail. Um, to the point that he could not see anymore. That's a hundred. He couldn't even see anything anymore. He was legally blind. Both eyes. But people of God, this does not stop him from preaching. And all it does is everything that he has studied and memorized. You know, I don't like what when you step on the pulpit, that you will never, problem. ever, ever know that this man know. was blind. Besides owing me money, right? Not money. only will he quote it, he will quote it, and he will read it, and he will not miss one word from the verse. Right? Okay. That's what we are talking about. A preacher must be able to quote the scripture from memory. About that, and this to... necessitates that he commit to memory certain verses and passages of the Bible. And let me tell let, 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 let me tell us this to, to be to, to be able to quote a passage correctly and impressively from the scripture, we engrave it upon the mind of the era, for it will leave the audience in no doubt as to the divine authority of the message as to the divine authority of the message. Praise God. Uh, Sister Sherry, are you talking to me to mute my phone? Someone's phone is Jordea. Jordea. Let me mute yeah. it anyway. Walters, phone need to be muted. So everybody, please put your phone in uh, airplane mode, if you don't mind. Praise God. But I don't think the sound is coming from here. Okay. So another point is it must study it by diligent application. He must study it by diligent application. There's no royal road. Uh, let me say there's no royal or easy roads to knowledge. It comes through persistent and painstaking study. Through persistent and painstaking study. Praise God. It is one thing to read or to hear or to talk about study. It is an entirely different thing to do it and more difficult still to keep on doing it. And this is, however, the only way a subject can be mastered. So as a preacher, 
uh, I have news. I have news for you. We like all the good news <laughs> or, or, or bad news. Study is the price that you must be paid for knowledge, and the price that must be paid, the price that you must pay for knowledge. Every preacher must be prepared to pay the price, or it will never become a worthwhile preacher of the gospel. No, no. And one other thing I want you to know is, if you do not study before you preach, the people that you preach to, they know. Oh, they know. Those that you are preaching to, yes, they know. I remember a woman told me one day, when he came to church after service, he said, Pastor, you know, the church is really far from my house. I said, I know, and I'm glad you made it. He said, for a few, a uh, couple of weeks that you didn't see me in church, it's because I went to, I went with my family to the church that's close to my house. He said, but I went the first time, the man preached, the second time, another topic, but still saying the same thing. He said the third time, different topic, but still saying the same thing. And he said, oh, I miss Global Vision. <laughs> he said the following week, they said, oh, we're going to just say, no, I'm not going with you. He said, because going there, I am not growing because the man is saying the same thing with different titles. So people of God, what am I trying to tell you is, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying we are perfect in global vision means, don't get me wrong. What I'm trying to tell you is if you do not prepare, those that you preach to, they know. They know that pastor didn't prepare today. They know. Not only will they know, even heaven knows that you're not prepared for your assignment. Praise the Lord. So the preacher must study it by diligent application. So each preacher should be able to study the Bible diligently. What do I mean by that? When you, when you come with me to page 43 of the textbook, it said each preacher should be able to study the Bible diligently. This call for heroic measure and a holy determination to allow nothing to hinder. It may necessitate getting up half an hour earlier in the morning, but the time will be well invested. Number two, each preacher should be able to study the Bible devotionally, which means he must allow the Bible to speak to his own heart and minister to his own spiritual needs before it can minister to the needs of others. It should be able to study the Bible discerningly, which means it must learn to distinguish between things that differ. It must study so as to rightly divide the word of truth. All scripture relating to a subject need to be consulted before one can come to a right conclusion regarding it. Hence, the need for comparing what this scripture says with what other scripture affirms. Praise God. You know, that's one of the reasons why I always recommend parallel Bible. You study this and this and this side by side, then you find out the truth. It must be, it should be able to study the Bible doctrinally. That means it must get a grasp of the great doctrine of the Bible. Sound words plus sound doctrine makes a sound believer and a sound preacher. What sound preaching should leave the audience sound in faith. Mm. It should be able to study the Bible dispensationally. Which means he must find out where he's in, where he is in relation to God's present program. 
or he may discover he is at cross purposes with God and his plan for this age, for this age. Mm. There's a note here that says, a lady once remarked to Lord Northcliffe, he said, Thackeray awoke one morning and found himself famous. Hmm. And Lord Northcliffe answered, when that morning done, Thackeray had been writing eight hours a day for 15 years. The man who wakes up and finds himself famous has not been sleeping. He has not been sleeping. It's only when he woke up and found himself famous, that's when everybody saw that and everybody knows what was going on. But he has not been sleeping. So if you want to fulfill the call of God to be a preacher, you must spend time to study. You must spend time to study. Let's look at the qualification number five. He must be a man or woman of prayer. He must, a preacher must be a man of prayer. A prayerless ministry is both powerless and profitless. As a prayerless ministry, the enemy will turn into a football field. We are the kick people's destiny around. It doesn't matter what you know in theology. Theology must ever be accompanied by neology. You must find a way to always be on your knee, cry to the Father. Because much prayer equals much power. Little prayer equals little power. No prayer equals no power. And prayer does not change the will of God, but brings the believer into alignment with the will of God. So that he now asks for that which God desires to give him in answer to believe in prayer. Mm. When we look at, when we start the scripture to look for example of prayer, we realize that Jesus is our example. Jesus, our example in prayer. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. The life of dependence, we are talking about Jesus now. The life of dependence upon his father was evidenced in two ways. Number one, by his own testimony. Let's go into the word of God. The book of John chapter 5. Verses 19 and 30. John 5, 19. See, then Jesus answered and said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, The Son can do nothing of himself, but what he seeth the Father do. For what things soever he doeth, this also doeth the Son likewise. And verse 30, he said, I can of my own self do nothing. As I hear, I judge. And my judgment is just because I seek not my own will, but the will of the Father which had sent me. We see the life of dependence of Jesus Christ upon his Father was evident by his own testimony, we can read it. Number two is by a life of prayer, a life of prayer, Luke 18, one to eight. We remember the story of that widow. Let's quickly go there. The book of Luke chapter 18, from verse one, the Bible says, and he spake a parable unto them to this end, that men ought always to pray 
and not too faint, and not too faint. Then it shared the story about this judge and this widow. Praise God. Let's continue. He withdrew from the multitude to be alone with God in prayer. Luke 5, 16. Our Lord's life is seen to have been lived in the atmosphere of prayer. Then let me ask you, who am I that says I can do all this without spending time in the presence of God? Oh, I know how to do it. If I can just study, if I can bring this, uh, if, if I can put this commentary and this reference Bible and this annotated book and that book and you are speaking the, the tongue that nobody understands what you're saying. By the time I get from here to here to here, I should be able to put together a message. You are putting together a sermon, but only a message from the Lord. Not a message from the Lord. Because a message from God will speak what is in God's heart. And for you to know that, you have to be able to spend time in his presence to know his mind. To know his mind. You must be able to spend time in his presence. If our Lord Jesus Christ had to do that, then who are we? I say we don't want to do that. Hmm. You see, our encouragement in prayer. Every believer is both urged and encouraged to pray. Remember the case when the disciples came to the Lord. The reason why they asked him to teach them how to pray is because they saw him pray. They saw him pray. So they now ask him, teach us how to pray. Teach us how to pray. If you're asking the members of your church, to pray, but you as a leader, as a preacher, you are not praying. You ask them to study, but you don't study. You know that's not going to work, right? Because like the oil, the anointing poured upon Aaron's head. <laughs> it, it trickles down all the way to the garment, to the end of the garment. Praise God. So if you don't do it, they won't do it. But when they see you do it, oh, you don't have to ask them. They will do it. Because they are not only listening to what you're saying, they are watching what you do. Praise God. So each Christian should therefore be prayerful regarding every detail of his life, regarding every aspect of his service for the Lord. You see, the prominence of prayer in the life of Apostle Paul. This guy, Chrysostom, said of Paul, he said, is three cubits high, but he touched the sky. Though small physically, but it was a giant spiritually. And, and prayer played no small part in his attainment to such spiritual eyes. We're talking about Apostle Paul. We're talking about Apostle Paul. And when we are talking about prayer, I will even talk about James instead of Paul. The history, history tells us that James has spent so much. The James that I'm talking about, we are talking about James, the lost brother. James that wrote the book of James in the Bible. He spent so much time on his knee praying. The Bible says his knee was as hard as a horse's hoof. His knee was hard that even if you take a razor to cut it, it won't go through. He spent so much time in prayer. How long and how much time do you spend in prayer? Hmm. Another qualification of a preacher, he must be clean. He must be clean in life. He must be clean. Hmm. Remember the adage that the cleanliness is next to godliness. 
that the author of this book is telling us that that should be altered. It should be, it should be read this way. Cleanliness is godliness as far as the believer is concerned. Cleanliness is godliness. Let's look at the absolute necessity for cleanliness. A preacher of the gospel should be above reproach in his life. A preacher of the gospel should be above reproach. It is essential that he has a good report of the unbelievers and people that are not from his congregation. Yes, everybody is hailing you indoor. What are the people saying about you out there? What are the people saying about you out there? Then let's look at the menace of inconsistency. It's a more damage has been brought to the cause of Christ through the inconsistent life of those who profess his name and preach his word than anything else has. Inconsistency. You live this life today, tomorrow, you become a chameleon. You fit in into the environment that you find yourself. And we're supposed to influence the world, not the other way around. Mm. Inconsistence of life causes both God's doctrine and his word to be blasphemed. Let's look at what the Bible says in the book of 1 Timothy chapter 6. 1 Timothy chapter 6 verse 1. Say, so let as many servants as are under the yoke come their own masters worthy of all honor, that the name of God and his doctrine be not blasphemed, be not blasphemed. What about the book of Titus? Titus chapter 2, verse 5. Let me read from verse 4. It says that they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husband, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, keep us at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. That the word of God be not blasphemed. A preacher of the word of God must be prepared to pay the price that such a position demands. And one of the price that we are talking about is to live a clean life. To live the life of righteousness and holiness. To live a, to live a life that will not put blemish on the name of the Lord. A life that will not cause unbeliever to say, no, 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 no. If that's what Jesus is, I don't want to accept that Jesus. And you are a preacher. Hmm. May God have mercy on us. Let's look at the peril of prominence. You know, a preacher occupies a far more prominent place in the public eye than those who take no part in preaching. So it is essential for a preacher to walk circumspectly before men. When we read the book of Ephesians chapter 5, verses 15 and 16, let's, walk, let's see what the Bible says. Ephesians 5, 15 and 16 says, see, see then that ye walk circumspectly, not as fool, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. 
because the days are evil. I put there the analogy of a pocket watch and a public clock. You see, a pocket watch and public clock, they both serve the same purpose, to tell the time. If a watch gets out of order, it's only you, the owner, is affected. And let me expose myself right here. You see this Apple watch on my hand, the battery has been dead for as long as I can remember. <laughs> and my wife tells me almost every day, you need to do something about it. I say, okay, who's watching? <laughs> who's watching? Nobody asks what's what, what, hey, what's time? What's, what's, your, what's your watch say? Everybody's looking at the phone <laughs> to tell the time. So, but right there, it's only me and those that are close to me. If I didn't say anything now, you wouldn't even know. It affects nobody. But if a public clock goes wrong, hundreds of people are misled. Hundreds of people, if not thousands of millions, will be misled. Those that are looking at that clock to catch the train, they will miss their train. Those that want to catch their flight, they will miss the flight. Those that are going for the appointment, they will miss the appointment. Praise God. You see, a preacher, you are a public clock. You are a public clock that cannot go out of order. You cannot go out of order because if you do, Thousands of people will be misled. And it's one thing to start off well and another to continue and end in the same manner. I pray we will end well in Jesus' name. The book of Galatians chapter 5 verse 7. Galatia 5 verse 7. The Bible says, you did run well. Who did hinder you that you should not obey the truth? Now, you see, let me read another translation with this so you understand what it's saying. It says, you are doing so well. Who we'll stop you from being influenced by the truth? Hmm. Another translation, the Passion Translation says, before you were led astray, you were so faithful to Messiah. Why have you now turned away from what is right and true? Who has deceived you? Who has deceived you? So preachers, I pray we will end well in Jesus' name. It is to be feared that sometimes the preacher himself becomes a party to this form of self-advertising. Self-advertising. There's nothing wrong in advertisement, but something is wrong if Jesus is not in it. If Jesus is not in it, if it's not about heaven, it's not about soul anymore, then something is wrong. Something is wrong. Mm. Let's look at another qualification. This is number seven now. The preacher must be fit for the work. He must be fit. When we are talking about fitness, the first one we want to check is spiritual fitness. He should be spiritually fit. Let me use the word must instead of should. It must be spiritually fit. It must be, be gifted of the Lord to preach or teach publicly. It must be gifted of the Lord to preach or teach publicly. Let me, let me, let me use, uh, let me give an example here. Uh, the first set of this Bible college 
the first set of students. There are very few. If I'm correct, there were five or six. A lot of people started, but only five or six graduated. So now out of these five or six, if I could remember one, two, three, only three of them were ordained. Only three of them were ordained. Why? Because these are the people that we could see the call of God upon their lives. We could see the gift of God in their lives. If we ordain the rest two or three people, then that would have been a serious mistake. It doesn't mean they will not be ordained in the future, but as of now, not yet, not yet. Because that call, the calling of God upon their life is not manifesting yet. So we have to wait until that gifting begins to show. Praise God. Because instead of them becoming a blessing to the kingdom, then they will now become the other way around to the kingdom. So a preacher must be spiritually fit. That means he must be gifted of the Lord to preach and to teach publicly. And he must seek by all means in his power to develop this gift. The first thing first though, the first thing is this gift should first be honestly coveted. Let's look at the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 31. The Bible says, but covet honestly the best gifts. And yet I show, yet show I unto you a more excellent way. He said, covet honestly the best gift. So this gift that we are talking about should be first honestly, honestly coveted. Number two, this gift when received must be steered up. The gift must be steered up. Praise God. Hmm. Let's look at the book of 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 6. 2 Timothy 1, 6. He said, Wherefore I put thee in remembrance that thou share up the gift of God, which is in thee by the putting on of my hands. Hmm. Hmm. Let, let me read this translation. This is very interesting. He said, I'm writing to encourage you to fan into flame and rekindle the fire of the spiritual gift God imparted to you when I lay my hands upon you. So you need to fan it, fan that flame, fan in that gift into a flame. Praise God. So that gift must be stirred up. Then the gift must be developed by exercise. You must start using it. If you don't use it, it will not develop. You must start using it. Like someone that received the gift of tongues. If you don't speak it, you will not flow. You will not flow in it. But when you first receive, it's going to be like a baby that's trying to speak. Sometimes you see somebody saying, ta -to, ta -pa -pa -ta -pa -ta. it's okay. Don't forget you are a baby to that gift. Then as you are using it, it grows, then it flows. Then it flows. Praise God. But this is the danger. If you neglect it, if you don't use it, you can lose it. You can lose it. The book of 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 14. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 14. He said, neglect not the gift that is in thee, which was given thee by prophecy, with the laying on of the hands of presbytery. Another translation says, don't neglect the gift which you receive through prophecy, when the spiritual leaders place their hands on you to ordain you. 
to ordain you. And we've been talking about the, develop, the development of this gift, the development. How can this gift be developed? It must be developed in the atmosphere of spirituality. It must be developed in the atmosphere of spirituality. Praise God. Now, let's look at physical fitness. Ah. Uh, I was in India, and as we were talking, and one of our pastors over there began to tell me, because when I look at all the pastors, they all have big tummy. <laughs> <laughs> they all have big belly and I asked them hey what's going on all of you what's going on you look like you have six months of pregnancy <laughs> so <laughs> what's going on and one of them said yeah that big belly is the identity of a pastor in India if you don't have big belly then you are not anointed I say uh oh you're wrong <laughs> I say, what I'm looking at right now, <laughs> that is not identity. <laughs> that is blood sugar that stayed in your stomach. <laughs> Praise God. And thank God they started working out. And some of them, they've lost that big belly. So a preacher must be physically fit. <laughs> it must be physically feet. Praise God. You see, there's something about preaching though. Public speaking exerts a tremendous strain on one's supplies of nervous energy. One hour of preaching is the equivalent of eight hours of physical labor in terms of the expenditure of nervous energy. Hmm. You see, when we look at the value of the body, we need to consider what we eat, when we eat, and how we eat. Let me say that again. We need to consider what we eat, when we eat, and how we eat. I'm reading from the notebook now, page 59, second paragraph. It says, each Christian should therefore take care as to what he puts into his body in the way of food. He should avoid what he knows by experience to be detrimental to his physical earth or what he realizes unfit for him, unfits him for his most efficient service for the Lord. He should abstain from either overeating or undereating and only take the kind and quality of food necessary to keep, him, to keep him physically at his best for God. That reminds me of one experience, something that I experienced years ago. Years ago. We're supposed to you no, know, we were getting ready for a prayer vigil, but we were hungry. And so around 10.30 p.m., then our prayer group leader's wife got in the kitchen and prepared some pan, pando or panda jam. We, we, today in America, we call everything fufu. Let me say fufu and some delicious soup. Oh, we enjoyed it, Jesus Christ. Oh, we enjoyed that meal. So, we so uh, the prayer vigil, we start at 12 midnight. We wake up at 5.45 in the morning. <laughs> we woke up at 5.45 in the morning. The food knocked us out. Yeah. A preacher, when you are going on the pulpit to preach, you need to know what to put in your system. 
when you go on the pulpit to minister anyhow. If not only when you are going to minister, what you eat, period. You need to know what you put in your body. What you put in your body. Not only that, what about what you put on your body? The, and the believer should also be careful. This is uh, the last paragraph. The believer should also be careful what he puts on his body. Each should see to it that the cloth one should be proper to the occasion and consistent with the demand of decent society. Decent society. Don't go on the pulpits to preach. And people that are supposed to listen to what you are saying, they are looking at what you have on. They are not listening to the word of your mouth. They are looking at the clothes on your body, the shoes that you put on. Don't be too flashy and don't be, don't be too ragged. We are something that is fit for that situation, for that occasion and that environment. We don't have to be flashy to show for the glory of God. Praise God. Some people, as you are preaching, they are Googling the price of the wrist, your wristwatch. They are Googling it, the price of your wristwatch. Somebody gave me a present of a shirt. And I look for the, I love the shirt. I look for this shirt. I couldn't find it. And went online to Google where I can find it. Then I realized that the shirt is almost a thousand dollars. Don't don't quote me. Don't quote. You see where I put that shirt is still there now because I have not seen the occasion that the fit. <laughs> The shirt of one thousand dollar. <laughs> it's in my closet today, and it's been almost seven years. <laughs> it's still there in the closet. I have not touched it because I haven't seen the occasion. Say, well, I'm going to church to preach. Then I wear a shirt of one thousand dollar for what? <laughs> May we not see evil. <laughs> Praise God. Now, people of God. We need to remember that our bodies are the Lord's. Our bodies belong to the Lord. You need, you need to present your body to the Lord for a useful life. You see, if you come with me to uh, page 61, And let's look at the last paragraph. He say, our bodies, which have been yielded to him, must now be kept for him. Paul testified, I kept under my body and bring it unto subjection, lest that by any means, when I've preached to others, I myself shall be a castaway. People of God, the flesh, or that principle of enmity against God, which each of us received through his physical birth is still within the believer. This corrupt nature we seek by all its art and wiles to use the body as a vehicle by which to express itself. This loss of the flesh must therefore be resolutely denied and the believer must determine must determine to rule his body and not allow it to become his master and not allow it to become his master. Praise God. So let's move to the last point for tonight. The value of good earth the value of good earth. Preachers should learn to keep his body in the best possible condition for effective service on behalf of him whose he is, whose he is and whom he serves. You've got to keep your body in the best possible condition. If you don't go to the gym to lose weight, Go to the gym to be in good shape so you can be useful for a long time. 
in the hands of your master. You see, many Christians who used to be active and useful servants of the Lord have now been laid on the shelf because of their failure to observe the simple rule governing good earth. Simple rule. Each preacher should make it his business as far as it lies in his power to keep his body in the best possible condition for effective service on behalf of him who he is and whom he serves. The book of Acts of the Apostles, chapter 27, verse 23. Praise the Lord. So this will be the end of tonight's teaching. If there's any question, please, there's room, the floor is open for question now. Is there any question? Okay, asking question is what let me know that you are in class, not only that you are in class, that you are actually coming along with us, that you are part of what we are doing, and that you have a better understanding of what we just studied. So, any question? And if there is no question, then let me give us uh, the pages that we need to read before we meet next week. You see that chapter four, okay, is there any, let me see if there's any question here. Okay. Oh, it says, I love this class. Okay. I love it too, woman of God. God bless you. I love it too. Praise the Lord. <clears throat> so, uh, that chapter four, please let's go ahead and read it because we may not get back to chapter four because chapter four will be the conclusion of the qualification of the preacher, the qualification of the preacher. That means uh, that chapter four, we have how many qualifications there? Number one, it says, oh, it must be fit for, no, that's chapter three. And chapter four, we have, it should be mentally fit. I think we have to address this. Yeah, we have to address this. It should be educationally fit. Oh yeah, we have to address this. And I first wanted to say, we should just read it. And you know, the one we don't uh, treat in class and you just read, that's where most of the test questions gonna come out from. <laughs> so, but let's read from page 65 to page 115. Uh, hold on one second, no 115. Page 55 to page 111. Page 65 page 65 to page 111. So God bless you and by next class, you should be able to have your first quiz for the one that we study today. And by God's grace, what we study today, if not tonight, by tomorrow, it should be available on YouTube in the Bible College YouTube channel. It should be available on YouTube. I know we still we all still have access to that YouTube channel. So we upload it, if not tonight, first thing tomorrow morning by God's grace. So, but let's study, let's read uh, page 65 to page 111. All right. Man of God, I have a question. Amen. You are very welcome, woman of God. God how, bless you. How, how do you it's good to have everyone uh, back in class? Hi. How, how do we how do so we... if there's no question then i have a question i think we bring 
tonight's class to a close. So shall we bow our head and let us pray? Our Father, we bless you. Oh, you can hear me. We want to thank you because you are faithful. Thank you for your grace and mercy. Thank you. Thank you for the grace to study at your feet. We she pray has that a you open our understanding. I guess you can want this class Go ahead, leave it alone. Class alone. Oh, this please continue to speak. Hey, Apostle, to somebody had a question. Leave it alone, leave it alone. For the assignment you have for us, oh God, so that we will not disappoint you. So we will not do anything by our own strength, our own understanding. Your word says we should not lean to our own understanding. Holy Spirit, we pray that you help us. We pray that you empower us. We pray that you equip us in the name of Jesus. Fill us with your Holy Spirit. Fill us with your presence, O oh God. Give us the grace not to disappoint you. The grace to fulfill our assignment all to the glory of your name. Thank you, ancient of days. We give you praise. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Amen. In Jesus' name, we have prayed. Amen. Amen. Okay, it said there's a question. And what is the question? Man of God, I think you muted that person there's because our phone what was. What is the question? God bless you. Please go ahead. You can just type it in. Ah. You can just type it in. Or you can unmute yourself. You know you can unmute yourself. Okay. Uh, so we will not struggle with that. If there's any question, just just type it in the chat in the chat box. Then we will address it right away. How do we incorporate both? Okay. How do we incorporate harmonetics with preacher and his preaching? Ha. Ah. God bless you. That's one of the best questions I've ever received here. <laughs> the thing is, we are not, you see, amonetics is for the spring semester. Oh, we okay. do that in the spring. So we are not doing it now. This is homiletics. Amonetics is the study of interpretation of the Bible. Homiletics okay. is the study of preaching and preparing a sermon. And both, you need both classes. You need both classes. Why? Because they both work hands in hands. Because if you okay. don't know the genuine interpretation of the scripture, you will not be able to preach it. You will not be able to preach it. Amanuetics will let us know when we study a passage in the Bible, is this uh, an inspira uh, uh, how can I put it? inspirational word of God, or is this um, a custom of the author of this book? Because in the monetics, we, we find out, we realize that we have two authors of the Bible. We have a divine author and we have human author. A divine author inspired human author to write. But it doesn't matter how spirit filled a human author is. It's custom, it's culture, it's character will reflect in his writing. So through amanuetics, you'll be able to filter out what is inspired word of God or what is just a culture of the land. But today we we put we mix everything together as if everything, yes, the Bible is inspired, is an inspired word of God. Yes, that is true. But there are some things in the Bible that has no spiritual significance. That, that has no more meaning than what it is as it is written right there. So that's why as a preacher, 
you should be able to know when you are preaching, you should be able to distinguish between this and this. And let the church know to the glory of God. That's one of the main reasons why we are doing digging in in our service in Global Vision Ministry in Morrow. To explain when you pick a verse of the Bible, we go with dig deep to look at the interpretation, the genuine interpretation of that verse. And how can that verse be applied to our life today? If there's something that doesn't have any spiritual significance, we'll tell you right there, this is just the custom of the land. It has nothing to do with it. No. It's like any someone that's, that stood up and say he's going to claim all the blessings of Abraham. That's impossible. You are not a Jew. And most of Abraham's blessings, not all, but most, most of it has to do with the land. You can know you are born in Riverdale, Georgia. And you're going to Israel and say, I'm a, I'm a descendant of Abraham. I claim this land. So that person, we died in Israeli prison. Because you cannot claim that. We've got to understand that. <laughs> yes, you can claim it by faith. There are so many prayers we pray in the presence of the Lord today. The Lord will just look and say, what's going on with this guy? <laughs> Don't you know this is not for you? <laughs> so, all these things, we need to know. We need to know. So, that's the purpose of amanuetics. That's why we do amanuetics and homiletics the same year. may not be the same semester, but the same year. Because they work hands in hand. They work together. Okay. As you know, amenities, you need to understand amenities as well. God bless you. Is there any other question? Any other question? Okay. Uh, Sister Waters, I hope that answers your question. God bless you. God bless you indeed. Then if there's no other question we have prayed, then I wish everyone a very good evening. It is well with you. I know you're having uh, Pastor Chris's class tomorrow and Pastor Tunde's class on Saturday. May the Lord bless you and grant you divine understanding of his word. In Jesus' name. God bless you. Have a wonderful evening. Mm -hmm.